The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. For over 95 years, we've set the bar. Power, we restored it. Protection, we reinvented it. Record yields, we redefined it. If there's one thing we know at FS, it's that just because something hasn't been done, doesn't mean it can't be done. We're never satisfied unless we take your farming operation to the next level. Run your equipment at peak efficiency and bust the bins this season. Visit fssystem.com. Well, as the grain market and the livestock markets quietly sauntered their way into the Christmas holiday weekend, we saw mostly green on the screen to wrap up Friday's session. We're going to talk about how these markets are looking through the Christmas holiday and into the end of the year. Joining us for analysis, Christy Vanon. She sits with Vanon and Company is back with us here on Market Talk. Christy, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you and yours. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Yes, yeah, same to you. Well, let's start with uh, just kind of that general holiday mode in the markets on Friday although we did get a little bit of green on the screen, which was a nice sight heading into the uh, Christmas weekend as uh, trade will get back to it on Tuesday. I got to ask, though, let's start with this. uh, Some of the breaking news that came out here on Friday, the rail crossings in Texas have been reopened as of Friday afternoon. That's been an item that's been in this trade here this week, uh, and it feels like... Traders didn't necessarily trade this news because it was late on Friday. A lot of people are out of the market. But what's your thoughts on how this news has impacted the markets or or not impacted the markets in grains this week? Yeah, corn was initially doing a good job holding lows, right? So your contract low at the start of the week for March corn was 470 and a half. We were doing a really good job holding that. Buying came in around 471 to 472, and you felt pretty good about it, right? As good as you can for corn, I should say, right? And so uh, you're feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you saw this liquidation start to happen and make some new contract lows. Initially, I thought it was kind of some selling pressure to show up just because you did make those new lows. As soon as you did that, you probably triggered some sell stops in there. But I really think it had to do with the rail information. And we're going to digest this to see, you know, it was not shut down for that long. But we all know that a short amount of time can cause such problems for our infrastructure. And so we need to be watching this moving forward. Basis levels need to be attentive to. But it's it's up and running. But the big question now is, you know, these are those little black swan uh, stories that we can't really expect in the market. We don't know how to read them. And so for it to come in and happen when corn is really sensitive to begin with, just because of its fundamentals, this is not what we want to see. So all your hopes, I think there's a lot of a lot of corn that really needs to get sold here yet out of the farmer's hand. And this isn't what you want to see, because really, you're hoping to be able to get back to these retracements, you're hoping to be able to get something out of the corn, and these stories are not friends to corn. Well, and, and in terms of this too, I wonder even with you know a week long shutdown, just with the amount of rail cars and the amount of goods getting backed up on either side of the border, do you think this? You you mentioned you know basis. We need to be attentive to it. Do you think this could depress some basis here in the interior uh, as we get into this week ahead, this final week of the year, and and move into twenty twenty four? What do you think, Christy? Yeah, initially the start of the week, there was some friendly basis pushes off the PNW. Uh, so if you were kind of central to West Central uh, in the Western Corn Belt, you really were starting to see these pushes, which was needed because if you look at the Dakotas, they had a lot of corn um, that was combined. And so you needed this push because ethanol's really been the only one being able to give a decent basis. So you got that friendly news and then it just seemed like everything was taken away with with what happened over in Mexico, even though the PNW bids are still there, they're still strong, but it definitely was a damper on it. And I just can cannot um, really state how much corn is in that Western Corn Belt that needs to get going. So if we could see this open back up and get moving, I think that could be great, but it really did depress the basis for a little bit and took away that friendly story that we had. And to be honest, corn doesn't have many friendly stories right now. So when we get them, we really need to capitalize on them. And we weren't able to do that this time around because of it. In terms of farmer selling here on this corn market, I'm going to stay with corn here specifically yeah. for a second. There's there's still plenty of carry in this market. 
Uh, but two here during this holiday period, you mentioned this to me before we uh, went on the air that, that some of the spread activity here in these markets it really kind of waned into the Christmas holiday. But as you look at this market as a whole, I, I mean, thinking about moving into 2024, those bin doors could start to open up a little bit more here as we roll that calendar officially over and get to a new tax season. But I wonder, you know, farmer selling has been pretty low. Will farmers continue to hold here uh, to try and find a better price? Yeah, you know, I initially had thought that you were going to see farmers be really stubborn with their corn, that you were not going to see these bin doors open. And I agree with that still. Um, the difference is we are having some crazy favorable weather in so many areas of the Corn Belt right now. You know, like here, I honestly cannot remember a Christmas that we didn't have snow. We have no snow. So, um, in fact, it's been like drizzly all day long, calling for some rain on Monday. Um, you know, throughout North Dakota, South Dakota, they don't have much snow either. It's really been ideal weather to be trucking grain right now. And so I do think that if we continue this forecast into the new year, um, you are going to start to see people say, well, the weather's really good. Maybe I'm going to get some out, especially if there's free DP right now so I can get it out while the weather's good um, and I'm not battling, you know, snowstorms or icy roads or all of those issues. Now I realize that's kind of a, a select area in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, but that's real right now. And I think that's where you're seeing that kind of um, put a damper on basis as well. For those that are offering free DP right now, I do think they're getting the bushels just because of the weather that's around right now. Um, also, when you're talking about spreads, you're talking about the carry in the market for corn. It is still very great to see this carry in the car corn. So if you really are looking at your corn, you're looking at HTAs and you're saying, hey, I don't think that I necessarily am going to want to deliver in Jan or Feb. I would say that you should take advantage of this carry that's in there and roll it to the March or the from March to the May contract. By the end of March, you're going to be delivering on a May contract. So really, I think right now is a perfect time frame to sit down and really strategically try and plan out when you're going to deliver these HTAs. Because if you look at beans and you can see the carry between the March, the Jan and March contract, even when we liquidated, even when we came back to 13, the carry has really eroded between the Jan to March contract. There's not much carry at all there when there really was a, a pretty significant one to begin with. And so I'm afraid you could see that happen, especially if you aren't going to see farmers selling that you, you're going to start coming in here and decaying that carry. So really sit down, think through that. And if you aren't going to deliver it Jan, Feb, get those contracts rolled out. Another thought too, you mentioned some of those things, you know, looking at delivery periods and more. And I know right away in January, we got a big USDA report that is always volatile, always uh, can throw a surprise or two out there with just so much data that floods the market. And with corn, you know, specifically, we got a lot of corn out there in the world. So I wonder, should farmers, what should they be thinking about risk management specifically to corn? ahead of that big USDA report in January, Christy? Yeah, I cannot stress how important this crop report is. So um, I know people have been frustrated with USDA. There hasn't been a lot of movement out of USDA crop report, so it's easy to kind of push it off. What's the worst case scenario that could happen? The market does nothing out of this. At least you're being prepared for something bad happening. So I really think to sit down and talk through your marketing ideas before January 12th is so important for not only corn, but also for soybeans. There's a lot of pencils being pushed right now for these numbers. And to be honest, we had a pretty favorable harvest. We had a quick harvest in a lot of these areas. And so USDA has kind of just been okay not adjusting too much. They got their initial push early in the fall to adjust the production. And then I think they've really just decided we got enough data in the beginning to give us a close enough estimate. Let's not worry about that until January to do the final. And so that's a concern of ours that you could really see them start to adjust those numbers because they haven't taken it. You know, your numbers are really all over the place. You're going to get harvested acres adjustments, yield adjustments, production adjustments. Um, demand you're going to get quarterly stocks there's so much out of this report and that's what makes it such a big deal is that really um you can take all sorts of different sets of data and push it in the direction that you want to trade this market we are joined today by christy van on she sits with van on and company for our market analysis as we wrapped up friday and headed into the christmas holiday uh, on soybeans here too, Christy, uh, we had a comment on our Market Talk YouTube channel this past week, and I'm I'm going to paraphrase this, uh, but 
I want to pose the question to you. I know South American weather, of course, has been a fairly big talking point here in this market. It's largely the only talking point in these markets for the last few weeks. Um, the comment was made, though, that it's not necessarily being talked about enough, just how much rain they really need in Brazil because the soil types are different. It's not like here in the U.S., et cetera. And uh, one farmer made the comment that, it, and the seemed like to me the comment was indicative that he's pretty bullish, the soybean market, that if these rains don't verify in South America, that I wonder the upside potentials in soybeans here, if it could be fairly great. Uh, just your thoughts with this soybean complex overall as we watch this South American weather, do you think there's a lot of bullish upside here into January? Yeah, so sometimes I, I I struggle with these questions because I don't want people to be like, oh, Christy's on again. She's always bearish, right? Because I promise you, I do get bullish. When I'm bullish, it's actually quite fun. But my goal, my job is risk management. So I am going to take that natural look at where the risks are. So when you're looking at soybeans, um, I have no problem being friendly soybeans. You're correct. They have been dry the rains that they have received have not been that great. It does look like their weather pattern starts to shift, though, that you start to get more flow coming in and you start to see these. My difficulty is that if we rewind this five months, right, four months, the whole talk was the fact that Brazil was going to have record production because of acreage, right? So we are coming into a position where even if you have yield decline, there was a sheer amount of acreage planted that is going to take a lot of crop damage to really push this market real low. We need to also focus on South America as a whole. Argentina's got some great conditions right now. So really, when you look at the two of them together and you put Brazil and Argentina together, you're going to have to have some serious, serious issues in production in Brazil to change the dynamic year over year. Right now, you're forecasted anywhere from like 15 to 18 million metric ton higher production in soybeans out of South America because of the change in Argentina. So if you're coming in here and most private estimates are saying, okay, we initially thought 165, now we're down to 161 for USDA. Some private estimates are 160. We got one at 158 yesterday. Those aren't enough cuts to really change the dynamic year over year that we're having more production out of South America. So that's where I get nervous. That's where I get really nervous to say, hey, you, you are going to not have a bumper crop out of Brazil, but is it enough to cause a drastic shift in the world dynamic? And at this point, I think traders are looking at it and saying, I'm not so sure it's going to. Now, once we get in the field, once you get actual yields, that might change a little bit, but mm -hmm. there is a reason for this market to be risk off when you start to see those rains show up. I want to ask you about the wheat side of the grain trade as well. Uh, largely, Chicago, KC, and Minneapolis wheat uh, have trended higher in the month of December. Uh, a lot of that on the back of the China buying of SRW wheat. Uh, but I wonder, too, you know, China's kind of disappeared from buying U.S. wheat once again here near the end of the year. And feels like, to me, the wheat markets have kind of cooled off. Some of that could be holiday trade. But I wonder your thoughts in wheat in general as we wrap up the year. Is it going to take China stepping back into this market potentially to give us another leg higher, or are we kind of going to be range bound here? What do you think? Yeah. So when you talk to some individuals on the cash side of things, um, I think a lot of those people are friendly on the wheat side. They feel like the bids are good. They feel like the demand is there. And so that gives me a little bit of optimism. We also need to remember that China is not a common purchaser of our wheat. And so I think some in the market got a little bit hyped up saying, okay, China doesn't typically buy wheat. Is this going to be like when they bought corn, right? They didn't usually buy a ton of corn, started with some small and all of a sudden they were gobbling up all our corn. And I think some traders were kind of, is this the start of it? And then we just kind of saw them step away and, and get what they needed. Now, I do think that they could possibly still be coming back for more. I feel like the bids are good out there. I feel like when you look at the dynamic as far as the world, you know, our U.S. carryouts were tighter, some questions over some um, crop out of, you know, winter wheat crop. But overall, you know, we don't have that accelerant. So we got our initial um, pullback or you know, retracement into the wheat market. And now we're stalling because there's no news. And that's typical for a market. But seasonally, wheat is supposed to be able to get up and running here. February is usually a really good month as well for wheat. And so um, we're not throwing in the towel yet. We're really hoping our targets do remain near $8 for Minneapolis wheat for both old crop and new crop to go on marketing. 
something I think that could help exports in general of uh, both grains and livestock from the U.S. This dollar's been breaking here on some of the the thought and the talk and the trade that we're going to see rate cuts, you know, in 2024. And, and I, I would think that with the dollar moving lower, that's that's got to be friendly uh, to try and help out exports here. I know this past week's weekly export sales for grains and livestock was was okay. Your thoughts on that dollar breaking and whether or not it could be supportive here early in the year for our exports. Yeah, the dollar is huge, especially for wheat, because it's traded so many different areas, right? You know, when when you look at soybeans, really, you have, you know, South American us, right? So mm-hmm. um, really, when you look at it, it's such a big player into our demand structure. It's been great. I feel like if you continue to see it lower, and you're exactly right, the tone has shifted from the Federal Reserve. And that is what we need to see is that a lot of people really thought that a soft landing was not going to be possible. And, and as we approach this, some way, somehow, it continues to feel like maybe that's going to end up happening. Maybe we're going to have this soft landing. And before you know it, start to have these cuts. You have mortgage rates, the lowest that they've been in quite some time. They're still obviously high, but they're they're off of their highs by quite a bit. And so these are all the writing on the wall to hopefully see this US dollar continue to kind of be in a lower end of the range and help us with our export demand. Let's talk livestock a little bit here as well, Christy, as we're kind of wrapping up the year. You and I are talking ahead of the uh, cattle on feed and quarterly hogs and pigs report and the cold storage numbers and all that. But overall, a a decent end to the week in cattle and hogs on Friday. Uh, But I think the same goes here with, with this cattle trade, especially. It's been volatile. It's been crazy. This month of December, especially, we've taken a lot out of futures and uh, watching the interest rate situation and more. Your thoughts just in cattle here in general, you feel like we can maybe go sideways here into the end of the year and then the early part of January. What do you think? Yeah, I actually am. um, If we can get through this cattle and feed and hog and pig report with nothing negative, I actually think that you could get some continued strength into these markets off a couple things. Like you said, uh, the stock market, um, where you're at right now for the stock market, you've seen such a growth in that um, up over 900 points on the week. So I think that alone is really helping people worry about domestic usage. Um, You came in here and said, you know, beef production is down 2% year over year. So you're continuing that rhetoric of saying, hey, fundamentally, this story hasn't changed. So we got the initial really negative cattle on feed, but fundamentally, we still have issues. Cash has slipped to a degree, but it's started to really stabilize itself. So the difference between futures falling off and cash falling off was so different. And so I think if you can kind of get those lined up, I do feel like you could get to those retracement levels for live cattle and feeder cattle. They are out there. They look good. But like you said, after that cattle on feed that shook the whole you know, dynamic, mm-hmm. I think people get really nervous coming into these reports. And we have to remember these reports, you have a whole weekend to digest them. So sometimes that's good. And sometimes that just gets people's blood boiling and they come in to start the week off really, really harsh. And so it's all de- going to depend on that. But I do feel like if we can get through that, the charts look good. Fundamentally, it looks good. Cash is stabilizing. I feel pretty good about it. All right. Well, as we wrap things up here today and we think about heading to the end of the year, final thoughts from you, Christy, anything else you want to mention or reiterate for folks here today as they work through the uh, holidays here and get ready for 2024? Yeah, so I've talked, we've talked about quite a bit carry decay, um, especially for the, the corn market. Uh, the real concern that December had a low of 447 and that it went off the board in mid 450s that you could initially see um, March want to slide down there. So we need to be attentive to that, but carry in this market is your friend. And so if you look out to DS 24 and you can kind of see where the price structure is, our targets are 530, but you're still looking at it and you're kind of coming in and, and for a brief second, you're like, am I going to lose fives all the way out to 24 as well? And $5 held. And when you talk to most producers, inputs are down enough that $5 is profitable. And we need to look at that. You know, we don't want to be in a predicament where we're coming off those big years where our break evens are so much higher than where our cash trade is. I think a lot of people are dealing with that right now in wheat. And so seasonally, this might not be the best time to be selling this corn a year out. But when you look at the price structure and if it's profitable for your farm, we are not opposed to looking at this market over the next 20 cents and saying, hey, let's make sure we're doing some risk management for it. And so I think that's key coming into 2024. 
Christy, great thoughts. If folks want to reach out to you and the uh, team there at Van On and Company with questions, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, you can call us at 1 800 648 5494. And I know they could find you online as well, vanonco.com. Christy Van On, she sits with Van On and Company. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining yes, us on the too. Market Talk today. Appreciate See it. Ya. Thanks for being with us. All right, that's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.